Hey guys, welcome back to Bumby TV. Guys, we're going to check out a video that is that a lot of you are going to come after me for, but this was recommended, guys. Like, I had to do it. We're going to check in how Jesus claimed to be God in the Gospel of Mark by Nebe Kuraxi. Guys, I don't know if I got the pronunciation correctly, but I believe he is late. Guys, let's get straight into this. So, what does Mark's Gospel have to say about Jesus? I'm going to distill it for you. Every time Jesus is asked who he is in a public setting, or every time someone says to Jesus, this is who you are in a public setting, Jesus has a response. Don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone. Even when Peter, his disciple in Mark chapter 8, says who Jesus is, Jesus says, don't tell anyone. There's only one place in the entire Gospel of Mark that Jesus comes out and boldly proclaims who he is. Are you with me so far? Let me see some nods. Good. And not this kind of nod. Okay. There's only one place in Mark's gospel where Jesus says clearly who he is. Now, up until then, he's been using a title for himself quite regularly. What is that title? So, son of man. Over 80 times in the gospels, Jesus uses the term son of man. The first time it's found is in Mark chapter 2, verse 10. The next time it's found is in Mark chapter 2, verse 24. Throughout Mark's Gospel, Son of Man is the one where Jesus uses the title to refer to himself frequently. Now, there are two sons of men in the Old Testament. One found in Ezekiel and one found in the book of Daniel. Okay, these are two very different sons of men. The, the Son of Man in the book of Ezekiel is a lowly human figure. God refers to Ezekiel in the vocative every time, calling him the Son of Man. Son of Man do this, Son of Man do that. And it's to emphasize how human Ezekiel is. But then there's a Son of Man in the book of Daniel, which looks very, very different. This is a Son of Man who comes on the clouds of heaven. What does that mean? The only being that comes on the clouds of heaven in the Old Testament is a divine being. In fact, God comes on the clouds of heaven in the Old Testament. So here in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 13, you have one who looks like a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. A very different son of man. Which one is Jesus claiming to be? Well, like I said, there's one place in the Gospel of Mark where Jesus boldly, loudly, publicly, clearly proclaims who he is. And that's Mark chapter 14, verse 62. In Mark chapter 14, verse 62, Jesus has been asked by the high priest, who is he? Who is he? Up until this point, he hasn't been saying. This is known as the climax of Mark's gospel. This is what everything has been building to. This question, Jesus, who are you? And Jesus responds, oh, well, the question is, who are you? Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus responds, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. You will see the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. So which Son of Man is Jesus referring to? I can hear you. Daniel. Daniel. He's, coming, he's referring to the one in Daniel, the Son of Man who comes to the clouds of heaven. That's the one he's been talking about. Let's revisit Daniel and see what the Son of Man is about. Daniel is looking at his vision. He's having a vision and he sees God, the Father, the Ancient of Days, being worshipped on a throne. So this is God the Father being worshipped on a throne, surrounded by angels. And then Daniel says something very interesting. He says, Behold, verse 13, chapter 7, Behold, I look in my night visions, and one like a son of man approached the Ancient of Days. So here's God the Father, the Ancient of Days, being worshipped by angels. One like a son of man came on the clouds of heaven. As only God and divine being comes, the Son of Man comes on the clouds of heaven. And to him, that Son of Man, is given glory, authority, and sovereign power. Okay, so whoever this Son of Man is, he looks like a Son of Man, according to Daniel. He's given glory, authority, and sovereign power. He's coming as a God into heaven. He's given glory, authority, and sovereign power in heaven. Then it says, people of every nation and language served him. Stop. Who is the one who receives service in heaven? God. Or you might ask, Nabil, what kind of service is this? Maybe it's some other kind of service. I don't know. Maybe there's, there's tables, restaurant tables in, in heaven. We're all going to get served, right? What is this service? This service, according to the Bible, 
Over 130 times this word is used in the Septuagint in the Greek New Testament. It's the word latruo. Every single time this word service is used, it's used as a word do only to God. Do only to God. No human ever receives latruo. Actually, one time a human does receive latruo and God curses that. He says, essentially, that is due to me. You are cursed for having received latruo. And yet here, the one who looks like a son of man, who has glory, authority, and sovereign power in heaven, came as God comes, is being served in heaven with the service due only to God by all people of every nation and language. And then it says his kingdom is one that will not pass away and his dominion will never be destroyed. Wait a minute. Stop. In the Old Testament, you've got God being worshipped in heaven, and then you have one who looks like a son of man being worshipped in heaven with the service due only to God in his own kingdom. No one tell me that there's no foreshadow of the Trinity in the Old Testament. It actually starts in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, but it's clearly found here as well. And as if Jesus needed to make his point any clearer, he then says, you will see him sitting at the right hand of the power. That son of man will be sitting at the right hand of the power. Well, what is this? This is a reference to Psalm 110, verse 1. In Psalm 110, verse 1, it says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, and I will make the enemies a footstool for your feet. No one in all of Second Temple Jewish history ever claimed the right to sit next to God on his throne. Not only did no one ever claim it for themselves, no one claimed it for anyone else. Because if you were to say that, then essentially what you're saying is that God has an heir. It's like the king sitting on his throne with his son, the prince, next to him. That's what it means to sit next to God in that context. That's why Moses was never shown sitting next to God. That's why Enoch was never shown sitting next to God. Or any of the archangels. They were all shown standing next to God. Sitting next to God would be blasphemy. That would mean that they are God. Yet Jesus claims not only to be the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven, whose worship with the service due only to God, but also has the right to sit next to God on the throne. He's the heir to the throne of God. Is it any surprise then why the high priests in this inquisition opened up their robes and said, you have heard the blasphemy for himself. What shall we do? And everyone responds, crucify him. What was blasphemy at that time? Again, I'm going to defer to Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman says that it's not blasphemy to claim to be a Messiah. It's not blasphemy to tell people they're wrong. It's blasphemy to claim prerogatives due only to God. And that's what Jesus claimed. That's why he was found guilty for blasphemy. That's why he was crucified. By the way, this claim from Psalm 110 verse 1, is it historically sound? Now, I've used Mark Gospel, but I don't want to make it sound like the Bible says it, therefore it's true. Historical Jesus scholars take a look at the term Son of Man, and they say that the term Son of Man fulfills the most stringent criteria of historical investigation. And what's that criteria called? It's called the criterion of double dissimilarity. This criterion of the historical uh, method is so selective that once it fulfills that, scholars conclude this must have been said. And we can, I can answer questions exactly on how that works if you'd like during the Q&A. That's how strong it is, the Son of Man claimed by Jesus. And what about the one that says Jesus was sitting at the right hand of the power? How strong is that? This is the Old Testament reference that's used the most in the New Testament. Over 20 times it's found in the New Testament. It permeates all sorts of letters. It permeates the Gospels. It's found by multiple authors in the New Testament. It is so woven into early Christian history we can't deny that it's at the earliest stratum. So did Jesus claim to be God? Once again, I argue that we can't ever claim certainty in these matters, but if we're going to say what's the historically most responsible and by far most responsible conclusion, I would say yes. The evidence points to the fact, even in the earliest gospel, interwoven through all the gospels, verified by the strongest criterion of historical investigation, Jesus claimed to be God. Hmm. Okay, okay, let's, let's take a pause. Let's take a pause because I know a lot of you are going to come after me now, but he said his own word. But I don't think Jesus claimed to be God. I feel Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. I don't feel I know because Jesus said he is the Son of God. God mentioned him to be his son two times in the Bible. So, 
I think more than two, but what I have read so far, I think is two. But that's why I said I think Jesus is on the world. Because Jesus, God said, okay, he was reading that Jesus is going to sit at the right side, the right hand side of God. So he is the Son of God. You know, when you want to go back and see, you know, the devil wanted to receive worship that was made to God. Like, the devil gathered some angels to receive worship that was supposed to be for God. But God cast him out. Yes, the devil wanted to take power, but God cast him onto earth. So, I personally feel Jesus is actually the Son of God. But based on what he said, and Jesus actually said, Accord me the same respect you accord to God. Like it was written. And this is what was written in my Bible. I know something different was written in your Bible, but it's kind of. But if you think about it, the Bible I believe in, this was written. The Bible, the Quran that you believe in, another was written. But we're trying to check. Okay, you guys, the Quran has been the same for 1,400 years, if I'm correct. But if I'm not, please correct me. And the Bible has been for like about 2,000 years now. But people are going to say the Bible has been translated. But I can tell you that it's so, not so. The original text of the Bible is still preserved. It's still there. And based on research and I'm not trying to convert anybody to my religion. I feel you should do what you think will help. Personally, I feel if you are a Muslim, you will go to Jeddah. In the sense that you pray to God, you, you hold the Ten Commandments because it was written in my Bible that if you believe in Ten Commandments, you go to heaven. And if you believe in Jesus, you will still enter his Father kingdom. So, the two still goes, guys. So, based on what I've read, guys, please, I am still read it i'm not i'm not saying this based on i've read everything and i know if you like i'm still in the process but based on what i've read i saw it in the bible that if you if you follow the commandment you're going to go to heaven it's that easy follow the commandment you go to heaven believe and receive jesus you're still going to go to heaven so guys tell me what you think about it. if you're just like just get to my channel i'll see you next time guys first